Amen. The love of God is indescribable and it's unfathomable as it reaches out to each and every one of us. And God's love is reaching out to us this morning on this 10th anniversary as we reflect back on the events and the circumstances that have impacted our nation. A day that we will never ever forget, but a day that will forever change America. And I believe that the Lord has brought to this congregation a man to speak the word of the Lord to us, to challenge us, to impact us, to encourage us. This morning, it is going to be a divine moment for you. As the word of God is declared and preached, God has a promise for each one of us. Now, family, this morning is unusual in that it is a special day for us in our nation's history but also for us together. And so we've gathered together, and I have, I have given latitude for the preacher of the Word of God to speak what God has laid on his heart. And so, beloved, I want you to open up your heart to what God has to say through Brother Palmer. He and his wife, Debbie, have been married for 36 years. They have three children, three grandchildren. They have had extensive and very successful ministry pastoring a church in Des Moines, Iowa for over 21 years. And during that time, Brother Palmer led that church to give over a million dollars annually and supporting over 800 missionaries across the world. He is an author. His books are out there. I would encourage you to pick that up. He has served as the general, Council, general secretary of the General Council of the Assemblies of God. And he and his wife have formed a ministry and called come alongside ministry in which they seek to encourage those who are hurting and to help those who have had pain and heartache in their lives. This man will speak from his heart to each one of us. Would you please welcome to this pulpit, Pastor John Palmer. Let's give him a great round, a Thank solid you. rock welcome. Thanks, Thank Pastor. you, friend. Thank you. Bless you. Thank you. Good morning. I love being at Solid Rock. This is my first time and hopefully not my last. I love the spirit of the Lord that I sense here. I love your pastor and pastor's family and the entire pastoral team. In fact, would you join me in giving God praise for the pastors that God has given you here at Solid Rock. Amen. They are a gift to you. We heard earlier uh, this powerful presentation and we want to give God glory and thanks to all who are our first responders as well as those who have served in the military. We had special honoring for the first responders last night in a powerful, powerful service And where Brother Stanley shared his testimony of how God helped him to escape the, 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 the rubble and the fire of the, of the South Tower 10 years ago today. But after having this presentation this morning, I thought it would be appropriate for all of you who are first responders or to any of you who have served or are currently serving in any of the branches of the military, if you would stand, and if you would join me in honoring them this morning and thanking God for each of them. Yes. Thank you. After the first service, several number of people indicated that the message had been a blessing to them it's not always easy to know as a preacher, uh, what do you say when someone said, I, I liked your message or I enjoyed the message? You want to be careful not to, to accept personal credit, but to always give God the praise. And I remember the time I was really especially aware of that and standing outside in the lobby after, the, after one of the services at First Assembly Des Moines, Iowa, and just wanting to give God the praise and honor for, for the ministry. And a lady came out and said, I really liked your message today. And I said, well, don't, don't thank me, thank the Lord. She said, I would, but it wasn't that good. So one, so one never knows exactly how to, how to respond. But I want to say thank you for, for opening your heart to, uh, to the Lord and to, to the message that God, has, that God has for us. If you have your copy of the inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God, I would encourage you to turn in your Bible to the first first book of the Bible, and in a moment we'll begin in Genesis chapter 37. Ten years ago today, tragedy struck 
America as three, three airplanes hit their target, the Pentagon, the North Tower, the South Tower, causing just immense pain. 2,819 people were killed. 343 firefighters lost their lives that day. We had a service of remembrance at Emerge Ministries last week where I am privileged to lead. I invited the captain of the Akron, Ohio Fire Department. And he mentioned to us that day that there are currently 343 men and women who serve on the Akron Fire Department, the exact number who lost their lives in New York City that day. 17 1,700 families received no remains of their lost loved ones, not, not so much as a hand or a foot or a bone. Over 3,000 children lost at least one of their parents on that fateful day. Over 1,600 individuals, spouse or partner, perished in the, in the tragic events of 9-11. Over 1.5 million tons of debris were, were cleaned up in the ensuing weeks and months. And as we remember, remember these tragic event, this tragic event and all that it, has, that, that it did in terms of how it affected the psyche of America and the, the, even the way we do life and business and travel, I'd like us having, many of us have watched documentaries the last few days on, on television. We've seen lots of pictures. Some of us were here last night. And we were remembering all of the, the, the tragic events of 9-11. Now for the next few moments, I'd like to take it from the national scene to the personal. For the fact of the matter is that there are many of us here today Many of us in Columbus, Georgia, who are feeling the effects of crashes in our own lives, because crashes happen to everyone. Unexpected job loss, a business that, that we had hoped would be so successful, all of a sudden going in the wrong direction. A marriage relationship that had all the all of the expectation for fulfillment and joy and blessing all of a sudden has imploded and left you with, with a, a blizzard of, of ashes and, and debris of personal pain. Perhaps it's someone who's hurt you deeply. They've offended you. They've spoken ill of you. They've, they've taken steps to, to intentionally hurt you. For some of us, those crashes are happening right now. For others, it's happened a while ago. Perhaps you had dreams of getting into college and those dreams have seemed to have, have, have dissipated into the air. I don't know what the nature of the crash is, but as I was praying about this service after your pastor so kindly invited Debbie and me to join you on this, this most um, honored occasion, and as I was asking the Lord, what, what message do I bring to this church that is that has such powerful preaching week after week, where the Holy Spirit is doing so many wonderful miracles in the lives of people. The Lord led me to these, verse, these chapters, Genesis chapters 37 through 50, to the life of a young man by the name of Joseph. A young man who experienced significant crashes in his young life. Joseph made four important choices. In the next few moments, I want to unpack those and share those and encourage you to note them somewhere, perhaps in the flyleaf of your Bible or on the back of your hand or on your neighbor's forehead, wherever there's plenty of room. And I want to encourage you just to, 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 take, to write down some of these principles, these four choices. Perhaps in your life, you'll be able to apply them immediately. Or it could be that you know somebody that you work with somebody in your neighborhood, you can share these principles with them. Share these choices so that we can be people who when our world crashes around us, we don't have to crash. That's really the big idea for the message. And that is that we, 
that we can avoid crashing even though our world crashes around us. Sometimes those crashes come because of the poor choices we make. We do things that cause our own life to crash. Sometimes it's because of others' choices. Others, it's just pure accident, but it happens to us. And so, so I invite you, please, to, to these inspired words in Genesis chapter 37 through 50 that provide for us some, some very powerful truth. The story is, the story is set several thousand miles from here in a place that we, that we today know as, as Israel, the promised land. When a young man by the name of Joseph, who had ten older brothers, found himself in a very, very difficult place. These brothers, Reuben, Simeon, Judah, Levi, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Issachar, Zebulun, they didn't like him. In fact, the Bible says they hated him. He was the youngest. His ten older brothers simply despised him. Genesis 37, 4 says they didn't even have a kind word to say about him. That hatred was intensified when he received a dream. And my estimation, unadvisedly shared that dream with them. And it intensified their hatred because the dream talked about how that someday these ten brothers would bow down in front of him. Not a good thing to say to your older brothers who don't like you. Then he had a second dream. And the scripture said he shared that dream with them. At 17 years of age, he perhaps lacked some of the wisdom that he would have later in life. And so he continued to share these dreams, intensifying. Then the situation was further complicated when his father gave him a special coat, a coat of many colors. The other brothers weren't given that kind of coat. The father made this for his son whom he loved and made no bones about it. He w this is my special son. This is my favorite child. So all of these things are happening. As Joseph now is asked by his father to go and visit his older brothers who are shepherding about 45 miles from there, a distance perhaps from here to West Point. And they, he said, go and see how they're doing. So Joseph left with his coat of many colors, which he probably should have left at home on that occasion. There's a time to wear the special coat, and there's a time to leave it at home. This was the time to leave it at home. But he wore it. And as he, he's traveling 45 miles, think of that, walking 45 miles. Then he arrives at Shechem, only to find out they've moved on to other pasture in Dothan, which, which is the city of, or the town of two wells. And there he finally, he finally finds them. And when he arrives, as he's approaching, does it? here comes the dreamer wearing that special coat. And they began to plot how they could get rid of him. That hatred, that anger, that jealousy was now, was now had intensified to the place where they were willing, they were willing to do something that they would have never thought about before, to take his life. They said, let's kill him. Let's throw him in, the, in the, this pit. Let's kill him. And then let's tell dad that some wild beast must have got a hold of him. Reuben, the oldest, thought better of it and said, no, let's not kill him. Let's just put him in the, in the pit for a while and let him suffer. And let's teach the young boy a lesson. So they caught him. They, took, they stripped him up the robe. They threw him in the pit. And they, the Bible says they sat down to eat lunch while their younger brother was in this deep pit unable to get out and then they saw the clouds of dust and the sounds of camels and chariots and they looked they looked in the distance and here here were coming some slave traders the Midianites Ishmaelites who were who were distant cousins actually and when they arrived someone said why don't we sell him let's make some money so they sold their brother for 20 pieces of silver. 20. 10 brothers. They each shared in the profit. And they sent their brother to Egypt 
as a slave. Is it fair to say that Joseph's world had just crashed in on him? Is it safe to say that all that he had anticipated for life, this young dreamer, this favorite son of his father, this young man who lived in privilege, now has gone from the privileged status to the pit, and now, now he's headed toward Egypt as a slave. The last verse of chapter 37 tells us, Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials. And it's here now that Joseph's choices become very important. In the next few moments, I'd like to share these four choices. I want to encourage us to, to think deeply about these choices. Because these are the kind of choices that will help us to stay strong in the midst of the battle and to avoid crashing when our world crashes around us. The first choice that Joseph made, we pick up the story in chapter 39 now, this first choice he made was that, that he chose to serve God. He chose to serve God rather than to do life without God. There comes that moment in our lives when, when our world crashes in, when everything goes the wrong direction, when all of that, that which we prayed for doesn't yet happen, when our health deteriorates, when our finances dissipate, when our life savings that we've been counting on for retirement are, are seriously weakened through a downturn in the economy, when things happen in our family and all of that, if we're not careful, if we're not careful, we can begin to, to be tempted. We can be tempted to lose faith in God. For there is an enemy of our soul called the devil who will whisper to us, so where is God now? Where is God now? That God you've been praying for, your loved one just died of cancer, so where is God now? Tempting us to, to distance ourselves from the very source of hope, God himself. But Joseph chose to serve God rather than to do life without God. For we read in chapter 39 over and over again at least three times that Joseph, the Bible says, the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. And the reason, the reason, my dear brothers and sisters, that the Lord was with Joseph was that Joseph had chose to stay with the Lord. He said, Lord, I don't care what happens. I don't like what's happening right now. I don't like being forcefully, I don't like getting beaten and by my brothers and betrayed. I don't like being sold as a slave. I don't like being a, a slave in, in, in Potiphar's house. But I choose to serve you no matter what happens. I am convinced, for I am persuaded, Lord, that you are able to keep that which I've committed to you against that day. And I will serve you no matter what. That's the kind of choice that I hope we're making. A choice that says, no matter what happens, no matter how bad things get, no matter how difficult the circumstance, I choose to serve God. In fact, his faith to, and, and, and his commitment to serve God was so strong that when Mrs. Potiphar tried to seduce him, saying, come to bed with me, he, he, outward, he, he very uh, strongly, very strongly rejected the temptation. And he said to her, how could I, how could I ever do such an awful wicked thing and sin against God. And he rejected her advances day after day with her, with her clothing, with her sweet perfume, and with her soft words. She tried to entice him, and he continually resisted. In fact, he resisted her to the point that, that one day she tried to seize him, and he ran away from her, leaving her his coat in her hand. And she had that coat and went to her husband at the end of the day and said, look what your slave, your servant Joseph had tried to do. He tried, tried to attack me, tried to have his way with me. And that lie caused Joseph to be sent to prison. Now he found himself in a very difficult place. What's worse than being a slave to Potiphar's house? It's being in prison, shackled. The Bible says he was shackled with, with iron bands and, and his feet were shackled. Psalm 1, in the Psalm, Psalm 108 tells us that. These, these things were happening to this young man who had committed to serve the Lord, but in the midst of all of that, his faith never wavered. He chose, he chose to serve God rather than to do life without God. The second choice that, that Joseph made, we see in chapter 40, was that he chose to serve others rather than to feel sorry for himself. It's really easy, isn't it? 
when things are going south, when our fortunes have reversed, it's very easy for us to begin to pity ourselves, to feel sorry for ourselves, to have seasons of, of whining. Have you ever met a whiner? Have you ever met somebody who's always, com they're complaining about the food, they complain about the weather, they complain, they complain about the music, they complain, they complain about pretty much everything. They're just, they're just the, they're, their song is not a song of praise, it's a song of whining. And it's easy for us to get into that pattern. When we've been hurt, when we are feeling the pain of, and the stab of, of grief or, or, or physical pain or emotional pain or guilt, it's very easy for us to feel sorry for ourselves and wish that everybody around us would pay more attention to us. If only people would love me more, if only people would say nicer things to me, if only people would help me. And we get into this cycle that, that it, that's an awful place to be. But Joseph said, rather than feel sorry for myself, I'm going to serve the others. So he, he got to the prison and he, and he asked, who can I serve here? So the prison warden let him serve the other prisoners. And when the chief baker and the chief butler and the cupbearer from, from Pharaoh were thrown into prison, he served them. Can I get you a bottle of water? How would you like your eggs? Steak, medium, medium rare, medium well? How would you like it? Dressing on the salad, what kind? What do you, what do you, how, how do you prefer? Iced tea, sweet or non-sweet? How, how would you like your... How, he just served. He looked for ways. He looked for ways to serve. We read throughout the entire 40th chapter, here is a man who is serving others rather than feel sorry for himself, rather than ask the question, why me? He asked the question, what now? Rather than say, Lord, why did this happen to me? Why did this, this happen? Why did this have to come into my life? He said, no, Lord, what do I do now? What do you have for me now? I was privileged to pastor Des Moines First Assembly for over 21 years. One of the men who became very close to me like a brother was named Dan Meckel. Dan was one of our deacons, a strong, healthy man, a bridge building superintendent. And one day while out inspecting one of the bridges they were building in West Des Moines across the interstate, the plywood in which he was walking tore loose and he fell to the ground and became paralyzed. It was a tragic situation for, for him and his wife Jeannie and, and their children, Mark and Matt and Lisa. And it, and it, and it, it, it touched deeply every one of, uh, of, this, of, of this large church who knew the Meckel family. Here is a man in the prime of his life who's now paralyzed and without a miracle from God destined to spend the rest of his life in a wheelchair. Several months after the accident, we, we had our, the first board meeting he was able to attend. We had it at the hospital so he could be with us. He was still in, in recovery and therapy. So we had it a, a small conference room there and Dan came. It could, as you can imagine, it was a moving moment for all of us as Dan we, was wheeled in, sat around the table for us to have our board meeting. And I said, Dan, is there anything before we start the meeting you'd like to say? And I believe until the day I die, I shall never forget the first words that this, this soft-spoken man of God uttered. As he looked at his body, racked with pain and unable to move. And he said, I, he said, pastor and fellow, fellow friends, he said, I'm just, I'm just asking one question right now. And the question is, Lord, what do you have for me to do now? Or what do you want me to do? Here I am, I'm paralyzed. What is your next assignment for me? He knew he wouldn't be building bridges again without a, a miracle from God. And life as he knew it had drastically changed. But rather, but rather than feel sorry for himself, Dan Meckel said, how can I serve? How can I help? He said to me, Pastor, what can I do? How can I help the church? I'm in a different situation, but what can I do to help advance the mission of this church? It, it's a... It's the idea, it's the thought. 
rather than feel sorry for myself, rather than pity myself, I'm going to serve others. So I ask you today, who could you serve? Ma'am, who could you serve? Perhaps baking a pie or some of your famous sweet rolls and taking them to someone across the street just to be a blessing to them. Maybe there's someone in the hospital or nursing home you could go. And you'd be saying, you know, I really would wish people would visit me, care for me, love me. I just want to encourage you to begin to serve others. It's, it's nearly, I found it to be nearly impossible to, to serve others and feel sorry for ourselves at the same time. It's just about impossible. And I want to encourage you to look for ways to allow the love and the expression of Christ's grace to flow out of your life to serve someone else, even in the midst of your deepest and darkest day. The third choice that Joseph made was a choice to focus on God's provision rather than fixate on his, his own pain and privation. I take you now over to chapter 41. Now Joseph is in a different place. He's now out of prison. It's quite a roller coaster ride from privileged son to the pit, to Potiphar's house, to the prison, now to the palace. He is now the prime minister of Egypt at age 30. This dreamer, this young man upon whom God had placed his anointing, and who had walked through 13 years, from 17 to age 30, 13 years of pain, 13 years of privation, 13 years of embarrassment, 13 years of living in a, as a slave and a prisoner, all of a sudden finds himself as second in command of, the, of one of the strongest nations in the world at that time. Pharaoh gives him a wife by the name of Asenath, and they have two children. They name their first child Manasseh and their second child Ephraim. I'd like you to notice, beginning with verse number 51, Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, I'm naming him Manasseh because God has made me forget all my trouble and my father's household. Now we know by, we know by, listening, by reading the story that he really hasn't forgotten his brothers. He still knows who they are. In fact, when they came to visit him later, he would put them in birth order around the table for dinner. He knew them, but God had enabled him to forget the pain of, that, of all of that had happened. And so he named his son Manasseh, which means to forget. And then the second son he named Ephraim because he said, God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. Notice, notice those two words in in contradiction, fruitful and suffering. He said, God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. So rather than focus on the suffering, he focused on the fruitfulness. Rather than focus on, on his pain, he focused on the provisions and the blessing of God. We have a choice. We can focus on one or the other, but it's very difficult to focus on both at the same time. So Joseph chose to focus on God's provision, on God's promises, and on God's faithfulness rather than to focus on his own personal problems. As Debbie and I were, have been walking the last few years through some difficult personal days, some dark days, a crashing type of experience for us, it was as a result of, of poor choices on my part we were in the midst of, of recovering from that when a friend, a friend said to me, John, remember this, pain is inevitable, but misery is optional. Pain is inevitable, but misery is optional. Pain happens to everyone, but we don't have to be miserable, and we don't have to spread misery. And Joseph experienced pain but he wasn't a miserable person because he was focusing on the, the faithfulness of God. So he named his second son Ephraim because he says, God has made me fruitful 
in the land of my affliction. God has blessed me over all of these last number of years. And rather than focus on the bad things his brothers did to him, he focused, he focused on the good things that God had done. Isn't that powerful? And you and I have a similar choice. Some of you have seen, un undoubtedly, a new movie out called Soul Surfer. It's a story of Bethany Hamilton, a young lady from Hawaii who started surfing at age three, who gave her life to Jesus Christ before she was five, who at age eight began surfing competitions, and when she was 13 years of age, surfing in the waters not far from her home, a shark attacked her and, and bit off her arm. Thanks to the help of some close friends who were skiing, or surfing at the time with her, they got her to help, and, and her, life was, her life was spared. She always dreamed of being a professional surfer. And 26 days after her left arm was bitten off by the shark 26 days later she was back in the waters at the same waters where her, where the shark had attacked her she was out surfing again preparing for the next competition today Bethany is a professional surfer she's 21 years of age she's ranked number four in the world among women surfers doing it all with with one arm as someone has said she lost her arm but she didn't lose her courage she lost her arm, but she didn't lose her heart. Bethany Hartman stands, as a, as a Hamilton, stands as a, as a symbol, as a sign of, of what can happen if we focus on the right places. And if you hear her tell her story, for she's a powerful spokesperson, she is a, a very committed Christ follower. She does missions trips all over the world. She's taking her message of hope and healing everywhere. When you listen to her, she... She talks about it. You can see it's obvious she's, she, she's had some difficulties, but she's chosen to focus not on, not on the problem, but on, on her God. And she's seen God do it work. I would encourage you to get that video and show it to your family. It's a wonderful, wonderful video, a wonderful movie that I know would bless your children, your grandchildren. And it's, it, it's a Hollywood production, very, very clean no bad words. It's just it's a great it's a great story. More than that, it's a story it's a story of a lady, a young lady, who like Joseph of years ago, committed to um, to focusing on God's faithfulness rather than on the pain that she experienced in her life. So what choice will you make? Will you choose to focus on your your pain and privation, or will you choose to focus on, on God's faithfulness and his provisions? And then the fourth, the fourth piece of this story, the fourth choice of Joseph, it takes us to the last chapter of, of Genesis. You thought I'd never get there, didn't you? But we're there. Chapter 50, he's now 56 years of age. He started this journey when he was 17. When he was 30, he became prime minister. Now he's 56 years of age, and his dad just died. Jacob and the brothers and the family, as you know, have come back to Egypt. God provided because of the famine, and Joseph's wisdom and his ability to lead made it possible for all the Egyptians, plus his family, to, to, have, to have food in the midst of the famine. But now dad dies, and the brothers are really, really concerned and they say to each other, now that dad's gone, Joseph's going to get even with us. He's, gonna, he's probably been holding a grudge for all these years. And what are we going to do? What are we going to do? He has power to kill us all. He has power just to wipe us out with his thumb. He could send any of, his, any of the soldiers of Egypt to just take care of us all in one fell swoop. And as they were sharing their concern, Joseph obviously was aware of that and and he said to them, and we read these words in chapter 50, verses 19 to 21. He said, what you fellows did, you intended it. You intended it for evil. He didn't mince any words. He was very truthful. You intended this for evil. But God, God meant this for good. Because it has resulted in the saving of all of our lives. He said, don't be afraid. 
don't be afraid, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zad, Gad, and, and the rest of you. Don't, don't be afraid. He said, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to take care of your children, and everyone's going to be fine. It's because Joseph had made a choice to forgive rather than to fight or get even or grow bitter. And you and I have that same choice. When we've been hurt, when someone has hurt us, we have a choice. Do we try to get even? Do we fight back? Or do we not say anything and grow bitter on the inside? Someone's described bitterness as the poison that we drink, hoping it will kill somebody else. Bitterness is the poison that we drink, hoping that it will kill the other person. So we get bitter, we get angry, we get resentful. But Joseph did none of the, of, of the above. 39 years before, he had chosen to forgive his brothers. A few months ago, I had the privilege of speaking with a man by the name of Walter. Walter shared with me his story. Walt Everett, son, I believe his picture is there. Walt, his son was, was killed by this man, Mike. Walt's son was 24 years old when this man, Mike Carlucci, pulled a gun, pulled the trigger on a gun, and killed his son at point blank range. He attended the hearings, of course, and the trial and the sentencing. And a year, a year to the date of the murder, Mr. Wald Everett realized that he was going down quickly. That, he, that the, the, the anger in his heart was, was, was eating at him and he was dying on the inside. And he realized that he had to forgive the murderer of his son. That he had to forgive Mike Carlucci. So he wrote the letter on the anniversary, the first anniversary of the son's murder. And he said, dear Mike, though I'm very angry with you, and though I'm very bitter at what you did, today I choose to forgive you. And that began a long, long journey. It resulted in another letter, another letter, another letter, an eventual visit to prison. And years later, when Mike Carlucci was facing the parole board, Walt Everett spoke on his behalf and it, and it prompted the parole board to, to give him earlier release. When he got out of prison, he found a lady, got engaged, and asked Walt Everett, a Methodist pastor, if he would marry them, and he did. And up to this day, they traveled throughout the northeast part of the United States telling their story in schools and other places of forgiveness. When I talked to Walt, said to me, John, said I was getting eaten alive by bitterness and, unre and resentment and unforgiveness. And he said, as bad as what Mike did, I knew if I was going to move on with my life, I needed to forgive. And I knew that if I wanted to receive forgiveness from God, I needed to forgive, I needed to forgive him. And so he chose to forgive. Remember that forgiveness is, is a choice. It's a conscious and deliberate act of the will. Forgiveness is not a feeling. For how many people have said to you, I don't feel like forgiving. Who would, for, who would feel like forgiving the man who killed your son? Would any, would any normal parent feel like forgiving? Who would feel like forgiving the man who walked out of your life, leaving you with several children to take care of, and, and, and now is living a life with with other women because he doesn't want the responsibility of, of hus being a husband and a father. Is there any woman in her right mind that feels like forgiving that man? Oh, you feel like doing something else, but not forgiving. But forgiveness isn't a feeling, it's a conscious and deliberate act of the will that, that frees the forgiven from guilt and blame while delivering the forgiver from anger and pain forgiveness is a powerful powerful tool it's a powerful weapon some of you are here today and you've been hurt deeply I want to encourage you to make the choice to forgive rather than the choice to live on with unforgiveness in your heart
So here we are, we're at the end of the story. Joseph lives a few more years and then passes, but his story remains powerful today. On this 9-11 day, a day in which we are remembering the tragic circumstances of New York and Pennsylvania that affect us, the lives of so many, now we're thinking about our own life and the situations in our lives and how are we going to respond I want to close with this, this metaphor that has helped me. In fact, in the darkest days of my, uh, of our, of my life in ministry, about two years ago, a good friend of your pastor's, Shell Osborne from Smyrna, Georgia, sent me a picture, and, and I think it shows up here. It's the picture of a, of a rearview mirror and a windshield. Shell, who at that time was a new friend to me, I just met him. He said, John, you know the reason that the rearview mirror is smaller than the windshield? It's because where you're going is more important than where you've been. Where you're going is more important than where you've been. And I don't, I don't know your situation today, but I want to encourage you, friend. Don't live life by looking in the rearview mirror. Don't live life by looking back with regret and saying, if only, what if, if that. But rather look out the, the rearview mirror and see the expanse of God's opportunity for your life. For God says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to, to give you a hope and a future. Call upon me and I will show you great and mighty things that you don't know. My brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you today. Let us let us choose to serve God rather rather than to do life without God. Let's choose to serve others rather than to feel sorry for ourselves. Let's choose to focus on God's provision rather than focus on our own pain and privation. And let's choose, as Walt Everett did, to forgive, as Joseph did, to forgive rather than to, to fight, get even, or grow bitter. And in all of that, we are choosing to live life looking through the, the windshield to a massive opportunity that God has for us, forgetting what is behind and looking forward to what is ahead. We press toward the prize for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus our Lord who has called us to serve Him and who someday will give us a glorious inheritance in heaven because we have followed Jesus Christ all the way. Would you stand with me please? and give, join me in giving God a clap offering of praise for being such an awesome, mighty God. Hallelujah.